Good evening, everyone. Hi there. My name is Dr. Nick Henshu. I'm the Director of Undergraduate Studies for the Department of Environment and Sustainability. And I, uh, I have so many people to introduce and thank before we get started that uh, I actually had to write a list. And this is uh, highly unusual. Um, but uh, first and foremost, we'd like to thank the Department of Environment and Sustainability. Uh, our chair, Dr. Tim Chevral, is in the back there. Our <laughs> Our seminar coordinator for our outstanding speaker series this, this year has been Mr. Ken Zidell, who's around here someplace. And our interview, uh, is, uh, our, our talk is going to be a little bit different this evening. We're actually going to uh, host uh, Lois Gibbs and John Feige, who is a uh, professor in our Department of Media Studies, um, doing a, more of a conversation rather than a talk uh, like you would be normally used to in terms of a seminar or, or a, a research-oriented um, speech. So uh, in the back there, we have really, really lucked out with, um, with our university archivist, uh, with, who is uh, Hope Dunbar, right over here. <laughs> And that, the materials that you'll see flashing behind us are, are um, uh, courtesy of the uh, university, the, hang on, I got it, I, I, wrote it too, I wrote it so sloppy I was all nervous, and the, 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 um, the, uh, the photos are courtesy of the archival Love Canal collection, especially the Penny Plowman collection, the Adeline Levine collection, the ecumenical task force of the Niagara Frontier, and we would like you to know that the university archives are open to students and faculty and members of the community for whatever research projects that you might be uh, endeavoring to work on. Most importantly, most importantly, the people I'd like to thank are, are the reason that we're all here tonight is, is we have a whole bunch of people from the community. We have, uh, we have my my very best next door neighbors, right? So, uh, but the real reason we're here is because we want our students to meet someone as amazing as Lois Gibbs. So um, just by, by matter of reference, for those of you that aren't necessarily part of the university community, could I have the, the uh, current and former EVS students please stand up just very quickly. Okay, these folks are why you're here tonight. This is the future of the environmental movement and we're pretty damn proud of you. All that being said, I'd like to introduce you to another dear friend of ours. Um, when we first got talking about who we'd like to have uh, introduce Lois this evening, one name came to the top of the list and it was Mr. Ralph Critelli. Uh, Ralph is, was a teacher in the Kenmore East High School for 38 years and based his entire curriculum. Uh, in fact, Daniel, you can attest to that, right? Your whole, class, your whole science high school class was about Love Canal and it was based around that and we said, <laughs> and we said, it's absolutely true. So we, we, we got Ralph out of the home just for this evening. <laughs> and we are so proud to have him here and, and have him introducing uh, Lois and John for us this evening. So please, Mr. Ralph Cretelli. Hi there. Well, Nick's already introduced John, so I don't have to struggle with his last name. So that's good. Thank you, Nick. I, I am here, and it's, it really is an honor. Um, it's the first time I've had anything but shorts on in the last two months. So uh, I asked Nick, what should I wear today? <laughs> um, he was of absolutely no help, so I just dressed up. I figured, hey, overdressed is better than underdressed. Um, so it, good thing I had the suit in the car. I did transfer it over from the shorts. <laughs> Anyways, it seriously is an honor. Has anybody here ever, ever read Ishmael by Dan Quinn? Show of hands. Awesome. This isn't working. <laughs> no, Ishmael by Dan Quinn. Have you read it? Okay. If you haven't, I do recommend it. It's my favorite novel. Something is stated on page 25 of the book. Quinn states, by way of a gorilla, <laughs> telepathically or imaginary or whatever, it's communicated on page 25. If you don't know what's keeping you in, the will to escape soon 
becomes confused and ineffectual. In other words, if you don't know there's a problem, how could you even begin to solve that problem? And once you do realize there's a problem, see, that's not enough. Once you have the awareness that you know that there is an issue, that's not enough. I don't know if you've ever read Blessed Unrest, show of hands, by Paul Hawken, one of the most noted environmentalists in the world today. Hawken writes in his book, I'm not sure on which page, what separates one life from another is intention. What is intention? Following through, gumption, persistence, focus, a bulldog mentality. That was my inspiration from Lois. When I read about her, and I taught for many years without ever mentioning her in class. <laughs> I started here at UB in 2007 after teaching in Kenmore starting in 1984. And I always wanted to expand my horizon and, and communicate my passion because I was inspired by many people and I was certainly inspired by her. I was inspired that not only did she have the awareness <laughs> that something was wrong, not only did she have, because of her motivation, that awareness for whatever was wrong, and you'll hear about that tonight, I'm sure, what motivated her, because we all need that spark. We all need that start. We all need that. What drives you over that wall that prevents you initially from getting over that wall? Because I'm sure she encountered many walls. I know I've read about them. But she kept on. Whether it was Hugh Carey, John LaFalse, or President Pinafama Jimikata. <laughs> She persisted, and uh, you know that's, that's what it takes. It takes that persistence. I used to show, I, I want to get the title right, I used to show the Bulldog, the 1983 Bulldog films in our own backyard, and it was about Love Canal, but the important part is the small sentence after that on the VHS tape. I know many of you don't know what that is. It's this thing we used to put it in a machine, okay? Anyways, okay, I, I still remember, uh, I still remember laser discs, Nick. <laughs> laser disc was about this big. It was bigger than a 33. Well, they don't know what a 33 is either. Okay, anyways, it said in small print, it said in large print, in our own backyard, Bulldog Films, all about Love Canal. I showed it every year I was here. And then it said in the small print, the first Love Canal. See, that's why the governmental officials were so resistant. Because they knew, they knew that this was only the first love canal. The first time in the world under CERCLA, the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation Liability Act, the first time in the world that a government stepped in and moved people out of their homes no place else in the world, I'm not saying there isn't pollution any place else in the world, first time it happened in the world where people were moved out because their backyard was polluted. It was incredible. It's incredible. But it wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have happened for, well, it might have still happened, but it may have taken many more years. It wouldn't have happened for the tenacity, to the, the gumption, like I said, the persistence of Miss Gibbs. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce you to a person that has inspired me, and I'm certain that she will inspire you, Lois Gibbs.
I brought my dog. Cool? Cool? Audio sound good, y'all? Good. Well, Lois, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so I want to thank all of you for coming. This is really amazing. Lois, as you can see, we have a sold out crowd um, for you here. People are super excited to hear your story um, and really to, to bring it up to date too. Um, and I just wanted to quickly thank Nick and Ralph um, and Ken Zidel for putting all this together. This is a really amazing uh, opportunity. I also want to thank Casey Stewart, who's here in the front row recording uh, audio for us <laughs> and help me prepare for this. Um, so just to let you all know, um, we're recording for the Chrysalis podcast. And uh, you'll be able to listen to this in a couple months when it's out. It's live streaming tonight on YouTube. Um, if you go to chrysalispodcast.org and sign up for the, the newsletter, you'll get a notification when this is out and, and, uh, and other shows. So please uh, silence your cell phones right now. Just take a second to do that. If you have a computer that bings and deep beeps, please turn that off. Um, so we're just trying to get as clean recording as we can for the podcast. So, yes? Higher audio. For me. Woo. How do I sound? How does Lois sound? <laughs> Great. One, two, three, four, five. One, two. Th My daughter tells me we cannot hear. <laughs> <laughs> Closer? Okay. Testing one, two, three. Buddy, down. <laughs> Buddy, down. Good so boy. tonight, Lois is going to talk to her dog, and I'm going to talk to my daughter. <laughs> and you all are going to love it. <laughs> all right. So, all good? Yes. All right. So you grew up on Grand Island. Yep. And that's just a stone's throw from here. Can you tell me about being on Grand Island in the 1950s, 1960s? What, what was it like growing up? But more importantly, what was your relationship to the land and the water and the rest of the environment when you were a kid? What did that look like? So anybody here from Grand Island, I'll apologize in advance. I hated growing up on Grand Island. <laughs> there was no movie theater. We didn't have a bowling alley. We didn't have a grocery store. We had nothing. Um, Grand Island was a perfect place to raise children, which is what my parents wanted to do. You know, it, was, it wasn't habitated like it is now. And, you know, we lived on Love Road, which is also a little like... Right? Irony. Yeah? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and, you know, I was one of six children, and we, we spent a lot of time down at the river. Not because we were environmentalists or, you know, into that, but, you know, the river had lights that shined on it. I mean, like, when you don't have a movie theater, you got to look at the lights on the river. I mean, you really get desperate <laughs> on Grand Island. It's not true anymore, but... Um, and I felt very strongly about getting off Grand Island. I actually never really wanted to live in what I saw Grand Island as a rural area. We had apple orchards and other orchards all over the place. There wasn't nearly the houses you have today. And the highlight of Grand Island was twofold. As a young child, you could walk down to Mesmer's Dairy and get an ice cream cone. And as a teenager, you could walk down the river and drink alcohol and make out with your boyfriend. <laughs> Which you never did, I'm sure. Not me, no, okay, of good. course. <laughs> and so you got out. You graduated high school in 1969. You got married right away. You had a kid right away. Mm -hmm. um, you moved to this lovely new suburban neighborhood called Love Canal in um, Niagara Falls. Um, your, your husband at the time worked for a chemical plant. Yes. Um, and you had your son in right before you moved in 72, and you had your daughter, Melissa, in 75. Right. So I'm really interested in this first moment when you arrived at Love Canal. What was it like there, and what did you envision your life being? Yes. Yeah, so it, first of all, my husband owned a house on Whitehaven Road in Grand Island. His parents left him. I don't think you knew that part. No. So he said, we're moving in there, and I said, we're getting divorced. So... <laughs> 
so then we were going to sell his house and buy a house somewhere else uh, off the island. And, and so I, when, I, when we found this house in LaSalle, so we didn't think of it as Love Canal. It was never referred to as Love Canal. It was the LaSalle section of the city of Niagara Falls. And it was extraordinary. I mean, it was extraordinary. First of all, I didn't lose my, my water because you could walk down the block from my house on 101st Street and, and be at the Niagara River. And you could go fishing and you could, you know, put your feet in the water or you could sit there and watch the lights dance off it from, you know, from different things. Um, and then in the center of Love Canal was an elementary school. And back in those days, the children would go to school in the morning, come home for lunch, go back wow. after lunch, wow. and then go. So, so in this neighborhood, which was mostly starter homes and starter families, um, there was big wheelies and wagons and giggling and, and laughing and crying and screaming and balls. And, you know, the, it was alive. It was dynamic and alive, and it was, it was really the ideal neighborhood. In the, in the northern end is another school, so we had like two schools that were huge, at both elementary schools, and then a creek that ran around uh, off the back. So the, if you were to say, I want to raise my family in a place that's not Grand Island, um, and, and was ideal, this was it. I mean, literally. And I, I had this three-bedroom ranch house with a basement, you know, and a white picket fence, honestly. <laughs> and I, I mean, I really did think I had like uh, achieved at 25, 26 years old, the American dream. I mean, we had HBO. <laughs> there you go. Yep. We had, we had like, you know, uh, and he, my husband worked at Goodyear Chemical. He was a chemical operator. And the thing about Niagara Falls is when you smell chemicals, you actually smell a good economy. Right. We didn't go in there smelling chemicals and saying, oh, this place is nasty. And we didn't even think the chemicals were coming from Love Canal, mm -hmm. which we knew nothing about. We believed that this, the chemicals were coming from the plant downwind, mm -hmm. right? So right. when the wind shifts because of the river, the wind shifts often, and you would smell chemicals. So, yeah, it was, it was a perfect neighborhood. Wow. So your son began kindergarten in 1977, and by December, he was having seizures yes. and had um, a really low white blood cell count. Um, and then by June of 78, uh, you began to take note of this series of articles written by Mike Brown mm -hmm. at the uh, Niagara Falls Gazette mm -hmm. about this, this toxic waste right. that was buried under the neighborhood, and you started to take notice. Mm -hmm. um, and your brother-in-law, Wayne Hadley, um, worked here as a professor yes. at UB, uh, was a biologist, and you went to him and said, this is what I'm seeing. What, 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 did, he, what did he tell you? And, and what was your reaction to, to kind of how, how he framed what you were starting to find? Yeah, I, when I went to Wayne after reading those articles, I really was very suspect that those chemicals were causing Michael's problem, all of them. Um, and later Melissa's problem that she had developed. And I went to him and I, I couldn't pronounce the chemicals. I literally could not pronounce the chemicals. And, and I handed them to him and, and he says, well, um, anybody who knew Wayne, he's very, he has a certain way of speaking uh, that's very direct but also very kind and gentle. And he would say, well, this one kills brain cells. <laughs> this one he'll never have a child. And this one, and, and, and he was, you know, he was really like, oh my gosh. And I was like, well, just stop with that and just tell me, is that why Michael's having seizures? Is that why Michael can't breathe? He has asthma attacks? Is that why he's always in the hospital with pneumonia? He said, well, probably, but you, but we, you never know. So you should figure that one out. Right. He, it, I found it terrifying because as I just said, I live in an idyllic neighborhood. This wasn't it, part of the plan. This was not part of the plan, and it was something that was so foreign. I'm a high school graduate. I graduated in 69, as you said. Um, but I didn't take toxicology or earth. I mean, back then, girls had to take home economics, shorthand, and typing, right? So we didn't even get the sciences. Um, and, and so it was terrifying. I mean, when he said, this causes brain damage, and I'm seeing Michael have seizures, 
That's my child. Yeah. And you put two and two together. You learned about these chemicals. Your child was sick. So you went to the school board. And that was kind of your first run-in with a whole series of authority figures that started the school board and went all the way up to the White House. Um, so tell me about that. You know, what, what happened at the school board and with the superintendent when you met with him, and, and how did you react? So I believe that it was the school, and only the school. I did not believe my home was contaminated at this time, just to be clear. Uh, Michael was in kindergarten, so I thought he was getting exposure. And as I told you, we go back and forth, and the kids stop and play at the playground on either way in or out of the school. And so I thought it was the school that was creating his problem. And so I called up the superintendents of schools and said, my child is very special, and he's very sick. And I think it's the chemicals at Love Canal that are creating these problems, and so could you please move him to another public school? And he said, why would you think that? I'm like, there's 20,000 tons of chemicals there. Like, why wouldn't you think that? I mean, this is not brain surgery. Um, and he said, but I didn't say it that way because I was very shy and quiet at the time. I was, and very respectful, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and so he said, look, if you can get doctor statements that says Michael's problems are related to the school, then come back and talk to me. And I'm like, okay, I can do this. So I went to my pediatrician, and I asked him for it. He said, I can't do that. Like, I don't, I don't know his problems are related to the school. I'm not trying to sidestep this, but I honestly don't know. But he wrote me something anyhow that said it possibly or could be related or some, some squishy language. Um, and so I took those back to the superintendent and said, here, you asked for this, and now move my child to another public school. We couldn't afford to put him in private school. Um, and the superintendent said no. And he pushed those papers across the table back to me. And I was devastated. These are the people who are supposed to be like protecting our children, educating our children, you know, the, the, rock, of, uh, the rock of your society, right, educators? Um, and he said no. He said, if I, if I move Michael Gibbs, then I have to move all 407 children. And I'm not about to do that for one irate, hysterical housewife. And I sat there and said, oh, I actually said nothing. I started crying. I, mean, like, I think I became hysterical. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and walked out. And I'm thinking, like, wait, the, well, this just doesn't make any sense. There's 20,000 tons of chemicals, over 200 different kinds of chemicals. It is leaking. Nobody was denying at that point it was leaking. Nobody knew exactly what. And they're not going to move my child? And, and, oh, and he made one other comment that really, the, the, they got my Irish. I have, I'm Irish, so I have an anger <laughs> problem sometimes. <laughs> so one, one thing that got my Irish up was he said, and if your son's so sick, why are you here? Why aren't you home taking care of him? Ooh. Wow. And I s sort of thought that's what I was doing here, trying to take care of my son and remove him from this danger. Um, and so it was clear to me that the system is not going to help me without a push of some sort. I wasn't clear what that meant. Like, what is a push? How do you push? I mean, I'm a mom with two little kids and like, um, but I figured it out. Yeah, and, and so that summer in 78, you started organizing your neighborhood. Um, you started conducting your own health surveys. You started linking the <laughs> the health issues you were finding to the pattern of water under you know, old stream beds. Um, and you were seeing this really disturbingly high number of miscarriages and birth defects, mm -hmm. cancer cases, other health problems. Um, but one thing I find interesting is by this time, there were already a bunch of major studies of Love Canal, including by the EPA, mm -hmm. but by federal and state agencies. And yet no action came of any of these reports. No. And so I, was, I, I wanted you to see if you could talk about you were doing these studies and these folks with PhDs were doing studies. Mm -hmm. What was the difference between those studies and, and how, what were the results that came out of each of them? Well, there was, there's a lot of differences. <laughs> <laughs> One, we're not scientists, so we couldn't verify our data. Um, but here, here's what the difference was. In, in, the first, in the first set of studies. The first set of 
the first studies they did were actually 1976, right? And they looked at the chemicals and the leaking in the homes immediately around Love Canal. And at the end of that report, it was done by Calspan and Associates. And at the end of that report, they suggested some ways to um, prevent harm, to, to not clean it up but contain the waste and keep it from leaking. And the last part of it listed those types of remedial actions they could do. And then it had this thing called cost-benefit analysis. The best. Well, I never saw a cost-benefit analysis in my entire life, but I guess it happens all the time. I know that now. And I look at the cost-benefit analysis, and I'm thinking like, well, wait a minute. What they decided in 1976, so this is two years before I ever even knew about this mess, is that the Love Canal families were not worth the $20 million that it would take to correct the situation at that time. It's really disturbing when you realize that economists put a price on your life. Yeah, and the way they do it. I mean, it was explained to me. It, it's all a mathematical model, which I quite honestly still today can't figure this whole thing. I have problems with bell co co curves. I can't even say them, let alone. <laughs> Anyhow, but look, these things are mathematical models, right? And he said, well, it's really easy, Ms. Gibbs. This is how it works. Your husband makes $10,000 a year at Goodyear. So he's worth $10,000 a year annually until he reaches a certain age. And your son is likely, more likely than not to follow in his footsteps. So he's worth $10,000 a year plus some inflation factor. Because you do not work outside the home, you are not worth anything. Wow. And because Melissa, my daughter, is likely to follow in your footsteps, she is not worth anything. I'm like, wait a minute. We, can, we, we cannot judge human life based on income generated by that individual or that household. And, but that's what they did. So, so it was, it, you know, it's just shocking to think. And they do this today, every day. Mm -hmm. Like, yep. they do it whether you put a grocery store somewhere or they're going to do a, a COVID testing or COVID shots or whatever, right? And I, I, was at, I was really in shock. Um, so we went door to door because we believed, even though we saw this and we showed it to people to say, like, you can't do this, um, it didn't work. So, so we believed that the system really will work. We just didn't push the right buttons yet. If we could figure out how to push the right buttons, it will work. And so we went out and did a, a survey. As I went knocking on the doors to close down, the first part of this was closing down the 99th Street School that was at the center of the site. And as I did that, people were telling me these horrible stories about you know, young people who have hysterectomies due to cancer and um, crib deaths and, and just one thing after the other. And I had a composition notebook and started writing it all down. And, and it was really clear that it went beyond the school, that this no longer was a problem of the, the school and either side of it, but the whole neighborhood is a problem. And so we wanted to find out what that was. And so we did. We went out with the help of Dr. Beverly Pagan and my brother-in-law, Wayne Hadley, for a little bit. Uh, and we went out and we started going door to door and talking to people about what, what's going on in your family. And Beverly Pagan was a researcher at Roswell Cancer Center, right? Yes, Beverly Pagan was a cancer researcher looking at the genetic association with cancer. So really important work. Um, and, she, and she, her and Wayne Hadley from UB here, they were working on the Great Lakes for many, many years. So that's how they came about to mix the health and, and the environmental work together. And so we went door to door, we talked to people and we were just astounded by what we found. So every time we found a cancer, we would put a red, I'm making up the colors, I don't remember, <laughs> a red pin in the map. And if it was a birth defect, it would be a blue pin and so forth. And we would put pins in our map of the community and look at what was happening. And we realized that there were clustering of particular diseases in particular areas. Why is that? And then we talked to some of the old timers because the smartest people on earth are the people who live there, the community themselves. They know more about their community than any expert or researcher. And so we are looking at you know, what, what is going on there and the, the former residents and the old residents were like, oh, well that used to be a big ditch. And then they backfilled it with gravel and other sort of tires and stuff like that. And, um, and it used to be connected to Love Canal, the canal itself. 
And so I'm like, oh. So Beverly put this all together in a very logical, scientific kind of summary da data. And she took it to New York State Health Department in Albany and pre presented it as a hypothesis of what was going on at Love Canal. And New York State Health Department took her thing and literally called it useless housewife data <laughs> collected p by people who have a vested interest in the outcome and that they were not going to do anything with it. Which I find extraordinarily interesting because, you know, when Dow Chemical does something, they, they, there's never a bias there. Like, no, not at all. How come theirs is not useless chemical data created by someone who make billions, right. you know? They're just trying to please their investors. Yeah, I mean, it's like... No, it, and she wasn't suggesting this was hard data because we couldn't verify it. We're not, you know, we don't have the research. But, you know, it was so insulting and, and for us as a community. So we're still believing that our system works and that it just needed to be another trigger. And it was really clear at that point that no one was going to do anything for anybody at Love Canal. No one at all. And so, you know, that's when we began to change our fight from trying to prove what's wrong to politically moving those in power who have the ability to fix it. Right. So this is this kind of amazing moment when you transformed into an activist. Mm -hmm. And you tell this story about your first, one of the first meetings um, about Love Canal they held in Albany, which is 300 miles away. Yeah and difficult and expensive to get to, but you and two other residents went, and, and you wrote this, this interesting comment about it. We, we, the first meeting you went into, you said, I was intimidated by the meeting. Me, Lois Gibbs, a housewife, whose biggest decision up to then had been what color wallpaper to use in my kitchen. Now, he, we, here we are going to Albany. It didn't seem real. But after that meeting you really started to transform quickly. Yes. How did that happen? And, and how, you know, when you think back on that now, what do you, what do you see? Like how, how did that, how did that happen? <laughs> I always say, I always start the answer to those types of questions with, I never cussed before Love Canal. <laughs> <laughs> I would have never did. Taught Sunday school. Um, when I went to that meeting and I went with, with my, my husband who has since passed, Harry, um, and my friend, Debbie Cirillo, who also went to Grand Island High School, but she likes the island, <laughs> can you say? Um, she, we went there thinking that we were going to present a petition to close a 99th Street school. We walked in, and this is no joke, we walked in, the three of us, and, and, and they said, oh, the meeting's down in the auditorium. And we're like, why is it in the auditorium? It's just three of us. We could meet in a smaller, oh, no, it's in the auditorium. It's like, no, 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 no. We could, we could meet in a smaller place. No, you go to the auditorium. So when we walked in there, the auditorium looked like a presidential press conference. There were so many media, so many cameras, so many microphones, and and the journalists saw who we were, and it's like, oh, I love Canal people, and they all sort of like, ah! <laughs> you know, it was, it was scary. I mean, those, fo those folks are, journalists are really scary. <laughs> Trust me on this one. So, so we wouldn't talk to any of them, because we didn't know, we were so confused, and we were so out of place, and we were intimidated. Um, and, and Debbie also was a high school graduate, and so we went and sat down in the front row and said, we'll talk to you later. And when, when they... Then the health commissioner for New York State comes on stage and he says, well, first there was some other dudes that were talking about methodology and all that kind of scientific stuff. And then he was giving the conclusion. And his conclusion was he was declaring a state of emergency at Love Canal that pregnant women and children under the age of two must leave, or they would recommend them leaving immediately. And, and then they started talking about other, we couldn't hear anything beyond that. <laughs> I know that their mouths were moving and words were coming out, but it was so stunning. It was so, we're bringing a petition to close the 99th Street School, and they have just told us that Debbie Cirillo's two and a half year old daughter just lived in a place that could kill her because she was over two. Right. And it was like, how can they do that? I mean, you know, I know about canaries and mines and things like this. My, all of our neighbors work in, in the chemical industry. My husband did. We understand all of that. 
It was just so terrifying. And the two-year-olds are going to, where are they going to go? They're going to go live by themselves? Yeah. Yeah. They, they, it, was, it, was, it, it even gets more ridiculous. So, <laughs> so I cussed at them. Debbie cussed at them. And all the way home, we're thinking, like, our parents are going to kill us. My mom's going to hear me say that F word. I should never have <laughs> said that F word. <laughs> I've never used that F word before. And I became obsessed with this F word. Um, <laughs> But but when we got to when we got to um, Niagara Falls, and my mother, who was watching the children, said, "Get over there! Get over to 99th Street now!" I'm like, "Mom, I just got home. I got to go to the bathroom. I got to like..." And you didn't watch the news, did you? Because I didn't want her to see me say the F word. Um, <laughs> and she says, "Just go, just go." And so, so I went over there, and I'm trying, kind of hiding, and. Um, I'm listening. They didn't have anybody at the community to tell them what was happening. They told us in Albany, New York, 300 miles away, that pregnant women and children are at risk, and there wasn't a soul, a soul at Love Canal that people could talk to. And it was just, oh my gosh. So there's this pregnant woman, and her husband's barely holding her up, and she's, and she's obviously pregnant, and she is sobbing. She is sobbing, what's happening to my baby? What has happened to my baby? What do I do? Where do I go? What does this mean? And there's no one, no one saying any, no one there. Like, what kind of government do we have that they can tell you you have to move, it's an emergency and- No explanation. Nothing, and no ways to mean. Like, there's, there's no money to move right. and move right. to where. Right. right, and of course, the two-year-olds have to bring their at least one parent with them. Right, somebody's got to change their clothes, and um, you know, it was just shocking. And um, I, w- I was, I was, I was a little bit in shock, and a little bit just, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, I, I just couldn't understand. This was my country. This is where we live, the richest country in the, in, and this is how they treat people. This is after we already learned about the Cal spam report and learned about this and. How come I'm worthless? How come my neighbors are worthless? How come we don't matter? Wow. And quickly, you became the face of Love Canal and of this movement. And there were, you know, you and lots of your neighbors were mm-hmm. organizing, mm-hmm. but you really got a, got pushed to the front. And and um, there was this tension between being dismissed continually as a woman, mm-hmm. as a housewife. Um, but at the same time, you were getting all this attention because you were a young mother um, who had sick children, mm-hmm. and you were standing up to the most powerful men in the state. Um, h- how did you navigate that tension between dismissal and this iconic status that you were starting to, to develop? Well, I don't think I actually understood the status, <laughs> quite honestly. Um, I, I was nominated because I knocked on everybody's door and they recognized my face, not because I was the smartest person in the hood, right? <laughs> <laughs> it just is. They knew me. That's why politicians knock on doors. Um, and here's the thing. It's like we had, I had nothing to lose. So if Governor Kerry doesn't like me, do I really give a hoot? Because he's the only one who fixed this problem. And, and it, you know, a lot of people sort of use the analogy of the mother bear, you know, up on hind legs and protecting it. And that's really how I felt. I, I really didn't notice so much all of the other stuff. I think peop- many people around me did. But um, one of the things we did in organizing Love Canal, which I think was, uh, I was speaking earlier with someone about this, um, was brilliant, is that I was the leader, the face of the fight, but I wasn't the decision maker. And I think that helped to smooth that over because you know they can keep dismissing me as a housewife, but guess what? I didn't even make this decision. 550 people came to every meeting, if you look at the film crooks, and every decision, major decision, was voted on by those people. You know, how many in favor, how many not? And and I think that that was the thing that first of all kept me grounded. Because sometimes I didn't agree with what folks were wanted to do. But I did it because I was, you know, nominated to do it, and, and they voted. Right, right. Um, and it, it, very quickly, you developed these really sophisticated strategies and techniques around organizing. And, and earlier today, mm-hmm. we were in the, in the UB archives, which has an amazing Love Canal connection. Yes. So all y'all should, should go check it out. 
when you can. Um, but you were, you were talking about a couple things you learned that were both around reading people. Mm -hmm. um, on the one side, you would choose speakers mm -hmm. very carefully, mm -hmm. um, depending on the tone and the emotion you wanted to convey for whatever the, the event happened to be. Um, and on the other side, you learned to read the various twitches of the <laughs> men <laughs> in power that you had to deal with. You, you Earlier you told me it was called the twitch theory. Um, <laughs> and, and so <laughs> tell me about these twitches. But, but more importantly, like what, how, how did you learn how to read people like this? And, and how did you use that strategically? We realize that it is the American people and most New York people in particular, that was going to push the governor to do the right thing, that we didn't have enough power in ourselves. And so what we wanted to do was use what we have to move the New York's population to go after the governor. And so how do you do that? That was the question on the table. And um, so the, a bunch of us leaders came together at my house. We, we did that often. A, a, the guys were downstairs with the pool table and the beer and the chemicals. And the girls were upstairs with the wine, the coffee, and the strategies. The smart ones. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we came together and we were like, how do, you, how do we make them? Like, what does Governor Kerry react to? Nobody knew. It's like, well, let's, somebody was talking about the, the VHS things, putting them in your, so we were putting these things in, a, in our uh, TVs and trying to see, replaying these different different news conferences and things we were at. And, and it was like, well, look at that. He really sat up straight when we said that. <laughs> he kind of like, when we said that. So that's not bothering him, but the thing that makes him stand up straight is bothering him. So, so there's something there. So we have to figure out what that something is. And if we hammer on the thing that makes him sit up straight, he's going to give us what we want. That, was, that is the theory, <laughs> the twitch theory <laughs> that we use by looking at people's reaction. Because we knew that we, we had to move the politicians, and we knew that we were not big enough, rich enough, uh, and white enough, because we had a a, a low-income community there too, with 240 units. So, so, so that's what we did. And um, and our our theory was, there. If it bleeds, it leads, right? Every news story. We're looking at the news story. It's like, oh man, why do they start with Barbara Quimby again? Man, we've heard about her her children so many times. Can they start with somebody else? Because Barbara's story is so powerful, so powerful. Um, and so, so we would line them up. So we would get to the public's heart by telling Barbara-like story. She, she has a child with three major birth defects and uh, lived there her whole life, so it was really sad. Um, and, and then we would have somebody there who would tell a different piece of information we need to convey. When, and you know maybe it's a scientific, maybe it's a health study, maybe it's something else. And then every single speaker would say the word, and didn't always get copied, obviously, but would say who the enemy was or our opponent. So, you know, a, a quick story is Phil Donahue. You, this crowd probably doesn't know who Phil Donahue is, but Phil Donahue used to have an Oprah Winfrey-like show. And we went on the show with 43 of our residents. And we took over the bar the night before, not to drink, <laughs> to work. We were working. Um, and... What we did is we practiced. So if Phil Donahue asks you a question, your answer is whatever, and you say, and Governor Hugh Carey can change that, or Governor Cuomo can change that, or later it was President Carter can change that, right? And, and so the first part of the show, that's exactly what happened. They, they were trying to get us in this debate with the mayor who was sitting up front, and he was just like, Lois, what do you think about the mayor? Not much, but. And <laughs> and so-and-so -so can do what we want. And so it was a great strategy, and we noticed it was working. So then we had to figure out how to perfect it. And in that one, by the way, after the second commercial break, Phil gave us a show. Wow. He said, ladies, take it where you want. Wow. I'm with you. So, so you know, it was, it was observation. I mean, you can go to communication school and learn all this stuff, and I think it's really important to do that if you want to be a communicator of some sort. Um, but you also can learn this stuff on your own. And I guess that's my message for all of you. You know, if your professor is scratching his head, yeah, maybe you shouldn't ask them that question the next time, right? Um, you know, if you're if you're angry at your professor, maybe you shouldn't say it to him. Find an 800 number of an opponent you don't like, and call it and say it to them. 
I hate your products. I hate what you do. You're just a nasty human being. And then your professor will be fine, and you can get your mark, and the world will go on, you know, kind of thing. So, I mean, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not really that hard. It's really not that hard, and, and I think that we learned it extraordinarily well. And, and it wasn't Lois Gibbs who learned it all. It was this group. You know, we were a team of people. Right, but I th even though it's not hard, most people don't do it. So I think that's also one of the things that made your story mm -hmm. so unique, because you all did all these things, which yeah. was amazing. Well, we did it because we had to. And I think it takes, it takes longer to execute something if you're doing body language. But why wouldn't you? Because the outcome, whether it's in a workplace or a school place or a family place, the outcome is always better. If you're talking to your mom and your mom is feeling like whatever, you know, read her language. And then figure out whether this is a conversation you should have now or later. I mean, it's just a general thing we all should do. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Life skills. Mm. So you fought this battle for two years. Um, mm -hmm. And there were lots of partial victories mm -hmm. along the way, partial setbacks, partial victories, back and forth. But in 1980, you and hundreds of other Love Canal residents took two Environmental Protection Agency's official hostage. Well, that's what the journalists called it. True, but in your book, that's what you called them, too. <laughs> And they were you said you do tell a story in the book that you were running around calling them hostages, and and your lawyer was like, "Don't say that word." <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, um, you took hostages, but you played it both ways. You were mm -hmm. protecting the hostages and trying to negotiate their release mm -hmm. with a whole bunch of folks <laughs> from you know the the White House and the EPA yep. to. Uh, a congressman and the FBI, who at some point were threatening to charge in and and or raid, shoot us raid the, the place or, the or shoot you if you didn't let them go yeah. within a few minutes. Um, so that's kind of amazing. Um, <laughs> and so later, Don't it do gets it. it gets more it gets more amazing. So later <laughs> that month, the White House announced that the federal government would evacuate all the remaining families. And later that year you were standing next to President Jimmy Carter in Niagara Falls when he signed the bill to buy out all the houses at fair market value. So let's walk through that. How did you get from taking hostages <laughs> at a time when 52 Americans were being held hostage in the Iran, uh, Iran hostage crisis, right. how, did you, how did you get from there to winning your demands and meeting the President of the United States? It was a long road. <laughs> we, we were... We, we were in May of 1980, when, when we were detaining those two EPA gentlemen for their own protection against the maddening crowd out front. Are you still we, trying we, to keep yourself out of jail? No, they said they weren't going to arrest me, so I think I'm good. But <laughs> I wouldn't suggest anybody ever do it. But at that point, here's what we were told. This was, this was the, the straw that broke the camel's back. And, and this is why it wasn't planned. It wasn't, you know. And we were told... We shouldn't go into our basements. We shouldn't go into our yards. We shouldn't eat out of our gardens. Women should not become pregnant. If they do become pregnant in any part of the neighborhood, you can leave until your child reaches the age of two and then you must return. <laughs> or your, term, your, your pregnancy terminates before a healthy birth. We were told, like, both schools were closed. We shouldn't send our, our children are being bussed out to school. Around our neighborhood were, were school buses waiting to evacuate us if, during the construction, something happened. We're living, but there's no problem so far, right? This is not, not a problem. And then they said they took a chromosome test. So chromosome testing was to determine whether or not we have this particular type of broken chromosome, which I can't pronounce. Um, and if we do, then we are more likely to have a cancer or birth defect of child. But the straw that broke the camel's back was, was twofold. One, they said that if we had an increase of this, it will af likely affect our children. So I'm holding my daughter. I saw your daughter. She's adorable. I'm holding my daughter, and I'm thinking that your whole life has just been altered 
by chromosome damage, which means cancer or birth defect to children or, I mean, the whole line of the family has been dramatically changed. And then second, like August 2nd, they didn't have anybody there to talk to the community. They talked to individuals who came in and got their results, and then they left crying, most of them, um, and there was nobody there to talk to the community. Like, what is wrong that you can give this horrible news and not have somebody there to explain to the neighborhood what does this mean in the bigger picture? And so we, I, as a leader, I, I tell all you guys are going to be leaders, guys and girls, whatever. Um, if things get really bad, you get targeted. So the best thing you can do, find a different target. So what I did is I called up the EPA officials that were still hanging in town and asked them to come to the office and explain to people what was going on. Because if I hadn't, I would have been the target. And so we did that. Um, they came. We put them in the house. We closed the door. And we said, well, you can't leave until we leave. And I'm like, mm -hmm. And then we, I called the White House and said, we are holding hostages. I did use the term. But it was shorthand for not having to say, we're protecting these gentlemen against that big maddening crowd out front that <laughs> seems to be getting larger, and they're drinking beer, and it's getting dark. And a, you know, So hostages was just a shorthand. Um, and so the woman who answers the phone, this is, again, our government. It's like every step, I'm shocked. I'm just shocked. It's shocking. Yeah. The woman answers the phone, and she says, you know, Miss Gibbs, Lots of people get cancer. Lots of people have problems. I'm like, you're not special. Yeah. And I said, look, lady, if I was a crazy, I'd kill these hostages right now and hung up the phone. I'm thinking like, <laughs> I am crazy. <laughs> what am I doing? I'm sure that eased, eased yeah. their concerns. But, but it, was, um, it was really hard. And what we did is we, we really pushed people in front of the media. Again, now we needed a bigger, we needed a bigger public that was going to say, look, help those people. They did nothing wrong. They played by the rules. They're hardworking human beings. Um, and so we really pushed, we called it the horror story of the week, where we would have a journalist come and talk to a victim, and they would tell this very sad story. Uh, and they would say, and President Carter has to do something about it, because now he's our target, right? And um, so the way we ended the hostage thing was, again, with our target. We knew who our target was. Not, not in a negative way, but the person who can give us what we want. Target's really a bad word, but it's a word I often use, and I'm sorry for that. But um, so when, when they said they were going to come and rush the crowd, I went out front and said, give me, give me a few minutes. I went out front and said, look, guys, we sent our message. Congressman LaFosse was meeting with the president for dinner that evening. Um, and let's give them till Wednesday at noon. And if they don't do something Wednesday at noon, we will make this look like a Sesame Street picnic to what we're going to do Wednesday at noon. And then we took a vote because we voted on everything. And the honest answer is I'm not sure that I actually read that vote right. Um, <laughs> but you knew what the result had to be. Yes. So, so, so you I knew said, the FBI was right there. <laughs> they were right there, and they're, they were just going to come and take them, and that would have been, that would have been awful because the crowd would have, oh, yeah. yeah, it just would have been messy. Uh, people would have got hurt. There's children in the crowd and moms with babies. and um, So, so the, we let them go, and we gave them Wednesday till noon. And before you let them go, is it true that you made them oatmeal cookies? Yes. Well, I didn't make them. I, I'm not a very good cook. But <laughs> I, I, there were oatmeal cookies. Okay. And, and so our, okay. yes, we did let them go. And so one of our hostages, Frank Nepal, he was the EPA communications guy. Dr. Lucas was the cytogeneticist. And so he, the following day, he sent me a telegram. Yes, they still had telegrams back then. <laughs> and in the telegram, it said, I hope you get what you are working for your happy hostage, Frank. <laughs> thank, you for, thank you for the oatmeal cookies. Well, I thought he was actually saying thank you. Um, but what I realized is he was a communications guy. He was saving our butt, mm -hmm. right? Because if anybody was going to say we were harassing them or, you know, we got this thank you for your oatmeal cookies <laughs> kind of thing. You're like, it's not going to hold up in court really well, right? <laughs> And so I'm like, oh, wow, that was really great. So just a quick side, I called him when I was in New York one time, 
And his mother answered the phone. I said, is this the right Frank Nepal? And he's like, yeah, the one who works for EPA? Yeah. I said, is he there? No, he's in Boston. I'm like, oh, okay. Can you just tell him Lois Gibbs called and said thank you? She goes, Lois Gibbs? The person who held my son hostage? Are you calling my house? And she went, she went off, flew off. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. We gave him oatmeal cookies. <laughs> and he liked them. He said they were better than yours. <laughs> so it was, I, I mean, I, you know, it was, it was really hard. It wasn't a planned thing. I don't think we would ever have planned anything like that. We were all anti-violence and, and stuff like that. But you, there was just nowhere else to go. Well, you had to manage, I mean, as you said, there's this crowd of a lot of dudes and a lot of alcohol building mm -hmm. up. I mean, mm -hmm. you had to manage reality, too. Right, and um, Barbara, Barbara Quimby held um, the hostages with me. It was the two of us. Uh, she's, she's like five foot two and 100 pounds maybe. Uh, really burly women here. <laughs> and, and so um, her, we, we slept with our clothes on for the next three weeks. Figuring at some, some point somebody's going to come and arrest us and we didn't want to go to jail in our jammas. <laughs> so we thought we were going to get arrested. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So precisely Wednesday at noon, everybody gathered at the homeowner's office, and I put a chair outside the window, or someone did, I didn't, um, and stood there, and we called the White House and asked them what they were going to do Wednesday at noon. And they, that's when they agreed to evacuate all residents temporarily until permanent relocation could be secured. And so the thing, the thing was that we were able to move enough of the general public across this country during a hot political campaign for President Carter, who didn't win. Right, it was um, 1980. Yeah. Big, big, big change. Big and, change. And, and, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a powerful movement in a little tiny community of people who were powerless for many, 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 many decades, right? And you all found that you really could move politicians when it was that election year when when the yeah. when the election was coming and whether it was governor Kerry or Cuomo or or the president mm -hmm. and maybe you got Carter to to act during his presidential year yes so so here's the other piece of story uh, that you might want to hear. So when, how did I get on stage? They weren't letting me on stage. You don't think they were inviting me on stage. <laughs> I've just held hostages. <laughs> you know, low. Um, so when we, when we went to the ceremony, everybody was there, the governor, the mayor, and everybody else. And I, they, they invited me to be in the audience. So I sat on the aisle and everybody said, no, you have to move in. You cannot sit on the aisle. Yeah, I'm sitting on the aisle. I'm still sitting on the aisle, and I sat on the aisle. Um, and then at some point I had to stand up, and the, the community had asked me to ask them for low interest uh, loans, interest rates, because the interest rates on home loans then was 12%. It was huge. Um, so, so I'm like, oh, I don't know how to do this, right? Long story short, so after, after a couple speeches, I stood up, and Secret Service immediately surrounded me and said, you must sit down. I was like, I'm not sitting down, I'm gonna scream. I'm gonna scream. I'm just gonna scream until you let me up front. And they're like, she's gonna scream. Not what, she, she's gonna scream. They were talking to their watch, she's gonna scream. And they said, okay, let her go. And so I went to the front of the stage and, and Senator Jacob Javis was on stage and he was the one who invited me up on stage. And then, you know, that's how I ended up there. They did not intend to bring me on stage. They were, and there's, there's two reasons for it. One, they didn't trust me, and there's a good reason for that, obviously. Um, but, but they don't want people to know that they can do that. Right? Right. right. The, the powerful doesn't want you to know that if you have a high school education and you're, uh, you know, a, a chemical operator in a local plant and you've never had much more than what you got, that you can't have that kind of power and we're not gonna recognize that kind of power. Right. And that really was what that, what that was about. And, and we knew that, which is why I'm like, no, I'm going to scream, because I have nothing to lose. I still have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Yeah, it, well, it's, it's a remarkable story. Um, and, and when it was all over, you, you write that when you first became concerned about the buried chemicals at Love Canal, you were concerned just about your own children. Mm -hmm. 
But by the end, your circle of concern had expanded considerably. Um, and you tra transitioned from my backyard to everyone's backyard. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was wondering if you could talk about how that transformation first changed your life. Mm -hmm. But then um, have you seen similar transformations happen with activists that you've worked with around the country? Mm -hmm. um, because after this was over, people were calling you from everywhere being like, <laughs> we have this pit in our backyard and what do we do and how do we... How do we how do we read the twitches of the politicians? <laughs> well, they didn't ask that question. They didn't know that. <laughs> and so you became you started going around all over the country and helping other communities. So so tell me about that that transformation there. So the question you asked earlier was about how much I recognize my own power, and that's when I recognize my own power. That or whatever recognition, whatever whatever that word was you used, and. Um, People were calling me and saying, you have to come help us. We have this here or that, or they're going to put one of those there or whatever it was. And I'm thinking like, you know what? I know something. It's just that simple. I know something. And I have some recognition with the public that I actually could go out there. Because you know, one of the things is like, the media won't cover me. They won't cover our story. They won't talk about it. How'd you get the media to cover it? You know, those kind of questions are very simple questions, but they're very uh, critical. And so that's when I realized I had some level of, of power and notoriety that made sense that could help other people. And so I would go to neighborhoods, um, and we always had a deal. I didn't go anywhere for free. So there was always a deal that, you know, even when I raised millions for my organization, um, you have to pay for something. You have to pay for something. Now, it might be give me a room. It might be make supper, you know, give me supper. But everybody had to pay for something, so it was a give and take. It was a relationship as opposed to me going in and telling them what they should do and walking away. Um, and I watched these people, all different people, all different walks of life, um, go from where I was as someone who was just minding their own business to then organizing a neighborhood and the neighborhood itself becoming organized and powerful to make the change. And that is the most rewarding thing ever. I mean, people say, why aren't you burnt out? Why aren't you angry as hell? Why aren't you? Because I see the transformation of men and women of all different um, you know, religions and cultures and, you know, I always laugh about you have to go down the south and you have to clean up your act, you know, and, and then you go north and if you don't cuss, they don't believe you're real. You know, that you have these and you have the independent mountain people and, and you have to learn about the culture, but oh my gosh, you know, going in and training people how to do this, how to learn about Twitch theories. Well, when you said that, what did he say? And what did she say? And what, you know, and it was, it's just very rewarding work. And, and what, in your own life, I mean, think back to when you first arrived at Love Canal mm -hmm. and the future you saw for yourself. Your mm -hmm. future changed pretty dramatically after yes. you left Love Canal. So, uh, you know, in your own life and in your own sense of who you were mm -hmm. and what you were going to spend the rest of your life doing, how did, how did that shift? It didn't shift. It just flipped. <laughs> I mean, it, it was not a shift. It was... You know, I was like, I can't go back to being a full-time homemaker. I, I, I know too much. I, I understand how the world works. I have something to share that I think is worthy of sharing. And, um, you know, I've got to go do that. It really became a, pa a compassion, passionate kind of thing. And, um, and you know, and I'm what I'm really good at is strategy. And so, and what people really have a hard time with is strategies. And so, you know, that was something like, uh, let's, let's have a strategic meeting and talk about strategies and who's your target and why are they your target and how do you, you know, how do you make them do what you want them to do and, and so forth. And um, it was, it was a totally different, it was nothing I would imagined right. at, in Grand Island. I wanted to get off the island, success. <laughs> I wanted to get married, success. I wanted kids, great. Um, and, but beyond that, I was going to go to nursing school and help seniors. Seniors happened to be my favorite mm -hmm. uh, thing. But um, then it was just like the whole thing changed. Wow. And after you left Love Canal, you moved to Virginia, mm -hmm. um, where you were hoping to continue raising your children away from dangerous toxic chemicals. Yes. Um, but soon you learned that dioxin, which is one of the deadly chemicals that was buried under Love Canal, 
Um, you, you learned that it's pervasive in the, envir in the environment, mm -hmm. particularly in the bodies of animals, mm -hmm. our bodies, mm -hmm. and the milk and bodies of animals in our mm -hmm. food system. Um, and in your book, Dying from Dioxin, here's something you wrote. You said, we can't shut down the sources of dioxin without finding the courage to change the way government works. Mm -hmm. And I think you could easily substitute other things for dioxin here. Mm -hmm. You could say, we can't shut down the sources of endocrine disruptors right. or PFAS or greenhouse gases mm -hmm. without finding the courage to change the way government works. Yep. So how do we find this courage and, and how must government change? Yeah, the courage is really hard to find, and it's become even more difficult today. And it's not because people aren't courageous. People in this audience aren't courageous. They most certainly are likely, more likely than not. Um, but people have to stand up and speak out. That's where the courage comes. People have to be willing to take a risk, and most people are not. Right. I mean, I literally was just in Alabama, in, in Birmingham, and a professor at the university I was speaking at said, I am not going to speak out against Alabama power because I'll lose my job. Right. Okay. I get that. But how do you do it with a bunch of people and you don't lose your job? It's not about you speaking out. And I think that's where people get confused. Um, if I'm speaking out, then I'm going to lose my job. And it's really, if you come with 100 people speaking out, you're not going to lose your job. You're not as likely to lose your job. I don't know what your job is, but right? right? right. Um, and, and so the only way we're going to change this, and, and we've seen what happened with climate change. I mean, this year has been extraordinary on the East Coast, West Coast, I mean, everywhere, that if people aren't willing to stand up and take some risks, I mean, stop being safe. And if you lose your job, is it really the end of the world? Right. Because we're losing the planet. How many children are being born out there with endocrine disruptors and genetic damage? And how, you know, the world has shifted because since, really since 9-11, people have become less and less likely to stand up and speak out. And the... Uh, Opponents of this, people who want to make money and keep power and have really used that to, to frighten more and more people. And, you know, the, the other thing I heard just a couple weeks ago was, well, you know what, I got my student loans I had to pay back and I got this. And I got, yeah, okay, but so you can be a successful lawyer for Dow Chemical. Godspeed, honey. <laughs> Why is that a meaningful job? Yeah. It is a meaningful job if you can get Dow Chemical to stop doing what they're doing in different places and only do the right thing, but you're not going to do that. Right. That we really need, I, we're in a critical moment, I think, here. I would not have said this 10 years ago, but I think right now we're in a critical moment that if we are so afraid, and fear is being pushed out there by every journalist, like Everything, like the, the Republicans, the Democrats, the independents, the companies, the economy, the banks collapsing. I mean, there's fear, fear, fear. That's all you see and hear. And we're not hearing these positive stories. And people are becoming a little more distant from the realities in front of them and wanting to change it. And I think that, I think that is at a critical stage now that I'm not sure how to generate the energy and, and the, the masses, we need to make that change, but we need to do it soon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you talk about, in your account of, of Love Canal, I mean, it's interesting how this university played a, a big role because you, you had mm -hmm. a lot of interactions with a lot of university mm -hmm. professors and, uh, and other yep. folks, and some of them put their necks on the line. Yes. And some of them did not, and you had yes. some words about the terrified, <laughs> untenured uh, professors who mm -hmm. wouldn't do anything because they were scared. I'm an untenured professor. By the way. Um, <laughs> no, so, right. um, so yeah, that it. I, I see it over and over again. Like, well, you got to make money. You got to, you got to fulfill some yeah. some strange yeah. idea about what your life was supposed to be. I, my husband and I drove here because we have lots of family things to do in addition to this in the meeting tomorrow. And one of the conversations we had was, was about wants. And, and we were talking about someone in particular, but then I, you know, I said to him, it's like, I don't want for anything. 
we don't make a lot of money. We, we, I've worked in charity my whole life. I could have I made a lot of money. But so, so you want this job as a professor or tenure, whatever, but is that really the most important thing in your life? And you really need to examine that. Yep. Yeah. Why are you doing what you're doing? Yeah. Are you just trying to keep up with the Joneses? And, and actually, research professors, I have to tell you, you're one of my biggest pains. And the reason is because you'll never, you'll never give your research to the public until after you've had it peer-reviewed and published. And it's like, it's too late. Yep. How many people, how many rivers, how many creeks have died while we're waiting on that? that there's got to be, and I'm not saying you shouldn't ought to do that because... You know, that's part of the, the rigmarole. But we, we need to think of other things we can also do. Like, can we do something that talks about what's happening to the Niagara River that's not a published research document, but rather a statement about what we, we are observing and what our students are observing and what humans are observing or fish are, you know, that it, it can't be. The, the, the line I use with um, with my communities. If you play by the rules, and that's all playing by the rules, by the way. If you play by the rules, we always lose. Rules have been created for people to hold on to power, whether it's money power or you know, places in society power. You ever go to a hearing or something like that, they like, you have three minutes, like, huh? <laughs> go to your city council. They'll tell you you got three minutes at the beginning, and you better sign up. No. This is my city. This is my council, right? So when you play by the rules, and this is about research and other things, there's important things, you know, that you need to do. But we got to find something else. Yeah, for sure. Well, in February of this year, there was a train derailment in yes. East Palestine, Ohio, that released hazardous chemicals, including vinyl chloride. Um, and one of the emergency responses was a controlled release and burn of the vinyl chloride, um, which potentially produced dioxin. It was a major, major environmental catastrophe. And at least a couple of the train cars carrying the vinyl chloride were traceable to Occidental Petroleum, mm -hmm. um, which in 1968 bought Hooker Chemical, which right. was the company that dumped all the toxic waste mm -hmm. in Love Canal. And it's kind of unbelievable how connected mm -hmm. all of this is. And, and really how it never ends. Yeah. And, and it reminds me of something you said on a TV show back in 2000, <laughs> which was, Love Canal is never, oh, sorry. Love Canal is not over. Love Canal will never be over. Right. How do you see a pathway for it to end? Or can you see a pathway for it to end? I'm hoping there's a pathway. I cannot see that pathway. I cannot see it. And I think part of the reason is back in the 70s and the 80s, there was a lot of street organizing around this. You wouldn't have had in East Palestine and not had Greenpeace there and all these other people there and raising issues. I will tell you, our organization, the Center for Health, Environment, and Justice, is working with those folks one-on-one. -on -one. There's nobody there. Aaron Brockovich showed up and left, and other people showed up and left, but there's nobody there to, I mean, other than... Stephen and my science director and a couple of our staff, but there's nobody there. Why? Why? Why is that? People just like why did they burn all those car loads full of vinyl chloride? The most toxic. It's so toxic, right? Why did they? Do, and why isn't the world outraged? It's not only about the folks there and the fish and the creek and the river. That all went up into the sky when we talk about climate change. I mean, why isn't the world outraged by the way that has been treated? And I will tell you, you go in, and our staff has, you go into those houses and around that site, your eyes begin to tear. Your throat is dry. You get sick. You get a headache. But they're saying it's perfectly okay there. There's nothing there. Yeah, I read an article that <clears throat> a bunch of the CDC workers and the EPA workers, they're all sick. Yeah. They went in to investigate. Yeah, and, and you know, and what, how did that all happen? Well, Ohio is really bad on regulations and enforcement. I mean, it's one of those states, right? Um, and they just let the railroad company dump those and burn them. And we had firemen coming and saying that was the worst thing they could ever do. And these are firemen who understand chemical burns and stuff like that. They're not expert toxicologists, but they understood that was the stupidest thing anybody could do. But th they let them do it because they wanted to remove the liability from the railroad. It was about the corporation protecting the corporation and 
we are now in this place in this country, I mean, everything's connected, this is connected right to the White House, that they are worried about transportation of goods and services because since the pandemic, we've had a problem. And so they had to open that railroad. Yeah. It goes, you know, east and west or north, south. I don't know, it goes one way. <laughs> it actually goes two ways. <laughs> it goes two ways. East and west? Okay, it goes east and west. And, and so all the goods and services coming in from Washington State, from California, from have to get to the east coast or, or vice versa. And they need it that open. And because they, a, an Amazon package might take more than two days to get there. Yeah. And that would be a total travesty. Absolutely. Or your, or your lithium battery for your new car that you're going to get, right? Right. right. Really <laughs> right. But, but they, they wanted to open it. And so once they burned that, they could move the, move the train cars and then the rails open. That's it. I mean, it's all, it's all connected to, it goes back to corporate control in dollars. Isn't it? I remember when the internet first began. Yes. <laughs> and all the utopian thinking about there's going to be this open information and everyone's going to know everything that's happening all over the world all the time and we're going to have this amazing democracy and accountability and this and that. And then, and then smartphones came and then mm -hmm. everyone could be there being their own reporter. Yeah. And now it's all gone. Like, as you said, we have a Netflix movie about this thing that happened in Ohio before it happened, two yeah. months before a big, a big uh, Noah Baumbach movie came out. Mm -hmm. And everyone sits at home and watches it on Netflix and feels like, oh, they've, they know it, but no, nobody's out there doing no anything. Out there. No, no one is screaming for change. Right. Everybody's hiding under the table or the bed. Or no one's writing folk songs about it anymore either. No, no, that's the other thing. There's no art in the environmental movement. Right. There's no folk songs. There's no sense of, you know, you had, uh, you had different people doing concerts. You had, you know, different... Earth Day events that were really Earth Day events based on real humans doing stuff, not corporate sponsored things that they right. do. Greenwashing events. Yeah, today we're going to recycle everything in Arlington, Virginia. Oh, how nice. You know, waste <laughs> management. They just put it in their dump, right? Right. <laughs> well, a lot of people see the legacy of Lug Canal as the Superfund legislation that passed uh -huh. shortly after you won uh, the fight for relocation. How do you think the Superfund legislation has succeeded or failed? Um, and, and what do you think needs to change about how we clean up or prevent toxic pollution from happening in the first place moving forward? Yeah. So Superfund has been very mm -hmm. successful at the beginning. It was collecting, it collects money from taxes on certain chemicals and oil and crude. Um, and it cleaned up a number of sites. And really, I think they, I think they did really well. Then the funding stopped, and in 1995, the Superfund went bankrupt. And so now the taxpayers are putting money into Superfund, and it's not, it's not very good at all. Right, and the idea was the polluting industries were supposed to be paying right. for it. Exactly, exactly. And so, so it's not cleaning up very many sites, obviously, because it doesn't have any money. And there's another thing about Superfund that's real interesting. It's called triple damages. So it's a legal thing. It says, if you make a mess and I want you to clean it up and it's going to cost this, and you refuse to clean it up, you want to take me to court, I can do triple damages, meaning if I won, instead of $20 million, you're going to give me $60 million. Wow. It was a big hammer that was never used in Superfund until Trump took over. And Trump actually did use it. Really? Yeah, it's surprising, isn't it? Wow. <laughs> he didn't want to do anything day. for the environment. You know, this super fun is little isolated pockets, right? So he could say he's doing something for the environment, but it's really mm -hmm. these isolated pockets. But, I mean, that was there, too. That was really, you know, extraordinary. So... You know, we're still trying to get Superfund reauthorized the, the fee because without the fee, it's right. never going to be cleaned up. And, and actually, they're not cleaning them up anyhow. At best, they're containing them mm -hmm. more right. than anything else. And so that means, you know, at some point, it's going to leak again in some way. And, and we've seen that actually down in the south where there were cleanups and then the tornado comes through or a hurricane comes through or flooding comes through or Katrina Katrina took the one in southeast New Orleans out entirely, uh, Agriculture Street landfill. So, so you know, these are, these are things that need to be cleaned up right. at some point. And that's why campaign finance reform is so yep. important and why um, election integrity is so important and all these things because yes. the corporations have so much influence over government. Yes, and, and people don't vote. 
I mean, if people voted, even the corporations with all their dollars, because we've seen this in smaller, small elections, not presidential elections, obviously, uh, but you can win. Like, if you turn people out, mm -hmm. you can actually win, and you can turn over a city council or a town council, and then you can move that person or persons up the, up the ladder to, you know, government level. Right, right. But, but I, I do want to add one more thing to the legacy of Love Canal. And I, yeah. I think Superfund is important. Yeah. I agree with that. But here's what Love Canal really did, I think. Two things. They o we opened the world's eyes, not just U.S., but the worldwide eyes, to the fact that chemicals in the environment creates health impacts, whether it's birth defects or cancer or other diseases. Before that, it was only about the workplace. That was all that was there. There was nothing about the community. And, and so I think that was really a legacy that we, we are quite proud of, and Beverly Pagan deserves most of the credit for that. Um, and then the second thing is, Love Canal really shows how democracy works. If you engage in democracy, if you can go all the way to the White House. I mean, I was standing next to President Carter, and it wasn't just because I snuck out and said I was going to scream. <laughs> It, it, was, it was all that time beforehand that they knew there were people behind me. There was power. They also knew that the public beyond the Niagara Falls community was looking at what was happening. And then it mattered to the public. And if it matters to the public, then it matters to the politicians. And so if we don't have money, which most of us don't have a lot of, um, we can organize people. And, and right. Love Canal really showed that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And... You know, I think another legacy is how much Love Canal changed the environmental movement itself. Um, because before that, it was really focused mm -hmm. on conservation yep. and ecosystems and not human health and not right. urban environments, not suburban environments. Yep. So c can you talk a little bit about that, of, of um, you know, how Love Canal changed environmentalism? Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, how did the environmental movement, the broader movement, how did it change you? as all of this was happening? <laughs> well, I don't know about that one. <laughs> I'll do the first one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'll do both. Uh, so, so, yeah, so when we were organizing Love Canal, we called really good people in New York State here, Sierra Club and so forth, and said, what do we do? And they're like, pass a bill. I don't think that's going to help. You know, I don't even know what you're talking about. Um, and, and so the, the green movement really was about the natural environment. And there was no movement that was about the humans in the environment, the, the humans as a as, as species, right? Um, and so Love Canal really brought that to life. And, and you know, that it, it can't just be about this or that. It really has to be about human housing. And people have to be at the center because <laughs> if they're going to die, so is everything else, by the way. Um, you know, the same. The same argument they were using about endangered species. You know, we were becoming an endangered species if you were in a low-income community or a community of color or da da da, right? Uh, and so, so that was really hard. And then the environmental movement didn't know what to do with us, so we became larger, uh, not larger than them, but larger, larger than Love Canal. And and once we became large, then they're like what are we going to do with you? And they kept bringing us, bringing us, the bigger us, to these meetings to ask our opinion, and then they would do what they always did before, because that's right, what they know how to do, ignore right? Ignore you. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it was really interesting, because at one meeting we had, we really made it crystal clear that here's, here's the problem, is that those who are working on legislation, whether it's local, state, or federal, they're really looking at control. How much can come out of stack? How much can go into the water? How much can go into the land, right? And if you're a community person, you're looking at prevention. Right. What can we do instead of this? Why do we need plastic bottles? Right. Why? Um, and, and so they, they, they have such uniquely different goals and focus that the two of them will never really be able to move forward as one because the people in the streets would have to accept the fact that some level of chemicals or bad stuff is okay for them. And that's not an acceptable thing, right? And so that's where the split comes. And, in, and they still, to this day, quite honestly, don't have a whole lot of respect for the women organizers across the country who are in these communities because they're not educated and you know i right. remember one time somebody's sitting at a meeting and they're leaned over me and said could you explain to lois what 
to my science director what risk assessment is, and he said, "Oh no, she gets it. <laughs> she knows what it is." <laughs> um, because we're just we're still being dismissed today, because we're women and because we may not have a formal education beyond high school. But it does not mean we don't know what we're speaking about and, and the value of that. Um, and the movement today is actually pretty extraordinary because it is a movement of people of color from low wealth, uh, it's indigenous people, and they have all come together to begin to move in a way that is making it unacceptable, unacceptable to poison communities because of their class, because of their race, because of their geographic location, right? And so that's huge, and, and from there there's also this realization that, oh, gee, the reason we're by these refinery in, Ca in Cancer Alley is that it was the only place black people were allowed to live. Right. Uh, you know, that, and, and the environmental groups sometimes don't get that. They're like, well, why right. don't they move? Well, it's not yeah. quite that easy. So, so there's communication problems, there's education problems, but, you know, they're both moving forward in the way they can, and, and neither one is right or wrong. They're both incredibly s strong, but, the, they're never going to work together one-on-one. -on -one. Right, right. And in terms of, I mean, one thing you touched on is this idea of, you know, Superfund is about cleaning, cleaning up disasters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do we prevent them from happening in the first place? And it seems like it's so hard to get to that point of, the, like, the plastic bottles and the right. consumption and the gasoline and the mm -hmm. vinyl and the clothes and the everything. Right. There's just so much stuff now. There is stuff, and we, you know, we talk about sustainability. I talked to a few people around campus today on sustainability, and the, and the thing is that the way sustainability is being pushed in this country is really harmful and not helpful. And one of the, one of the examples, I think one good example, is this whole in New York State in 2024, you can't have a gas stove, right? But I was in your dining area, and there's gas all around where the students sit and read, study, chat, whatever they do. Or there's lots of places, hotels and high-end homes that have gas fireplaces. Why are we beginning to talk about gas being a problem, which it is, I'm not denying the problem, but why is the beginning that we take people's stoves away <laughs> as opposed to what you have in your lobby or it's somebody else's. So when you talk about sustainability, or, or we can talk about electric cars, and what, 35, if Biden wants some wonderful number, well, good for him. And, and who's going to buy those cars? Like, the students here can't afford, for sure. Well, maybe some of them, I don't know. <laughs> but, but, you know, who's going to buy them? And what is the, what is the price of those cars? It's, we don't have the wind and the solar to... You know, what are we doing and where are we, where are we getting the batteries, the stuff for the batteries? We're digging in people's property. We're creating new love canals across the world, yep. right? So, so to say it's an electric car and it's clean, well, yeah, in one way, but we have to follow the food chain all the way around. And so I think, I, I believe in sustainability and I think it has to happen. But I think people who are working in sustainability have to get their butts together and their heads together and figure out how they do it so it doesn't look like it's moving poor people and working class people to do without why those who have continue to have. Right. It's just not right. Right. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think your gas thing is beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, related to that, I wanted to ask you, here's another kind of connection of things. In, in 1962, mm -hmm. while you were still in grade school, mm -hmm. Rachel Carson wrote in Silent Spring about the dangers of our efforts to control yeah. nature. Yeah. And specifically, she was talking about DDT and the mm -hmm. devastating unintended consequences it has on birds and people right. and right. other living things. <clears throat> and then back in 1946, uh, Hooker Chemical Company started producing DDT mm -hmm. in their plant here in Niagara yeah. Falls. Um, and this is the period they were dumping toxic waste yep. at Love Canal. Um, and the canal itself is there because another industrialist, William Love, wanted to build an artificial falls higher and more powerful than Niagara Falls itself, mm -hmm. but abandoned his partially built canal and his grandiose dreams mm -hmm. before it was completed 
which gave a perfect pit for Hooker Chemical to dump their DDT and mm -hmm. other waste into. Um, and I, I was just wondering if you could reflect on this idea of, of over the course of your lifetime, how do you see the control of nature and the hubris and the folly that can come with it? Yeah, I'm, I don't know. You know, it's... But you bring up the technology. You know, one thing I think about sometimes is we love techno fixes mm -hmm. for things. And the environmental discourse right now is so much about mm -hmm. the stoves and the electric cars right. and the solar panels and all that. And all that is very important. But we want to do more and more and more and more right. when a lot of what we need to do is less and less and less. Right. And that's not part of the conversation most of the time. Right. And, it, and it's not part of the conversation. It should be. It should be. That's what I want to do. That, that would be my goal. But you can't make money on doing less. No. That's a problem. I always said, if we could give Exxon the sun, rights to the sun, everybody would have solar power. <laughs> right. Because, because he, they would charge everybody, and they would be, have an incentive to build solar powers on everything, right? So, so less is better, but how do we get to less when we have a capitalist economy? Right. And you know, the fight that was happening out west just recently is between solar solar panel farms and farmers who don't want solar panel farms on rich farmland and and yet they have nothing to do they can't say anything about it because they don't own the property right it's being bought by the solar power people and so so I agree with you I just my, my problem is I don't know how you get there right it's and, hard. and 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 it's a well it I guess it only works if people stop buying products and that's not going to happen either because everybody wants a new iPhone. Yeah. Well, and it goes back, I think, to your comment about changing government. Yeah. You know, we need to change the relationship we have with government. We need to change the, the relationship the government has to private mm -hmm. business mm -hmm. and to the flow of money and the accumulation yeah. of ridiculous amounts of, of cash and capital by a very yeah. few number of people. I mean, I remember going overseas a long time ago. And just being amazed at how they don't have plastic everywhere. Right. You know, and they wrap your stuff in paper mm -hmm. and you bring your own bags and, you know, they have glass bottles and they fill your, your container. And, you know, there's just, there's just something about that. It's not, it's not unacceptable and it's quite a nice way to live, by the way. Yes. Um, and yet, if you can't make money, it's not going to happen in America. And that's right. the problem. But they don't have gas stations on every corner. It's yeah. so inconvenient. <laughs> Well, that, not when you have, you better have some plug-in things. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. <laughs> well, what does the fight for environmental justice look like today? And, and how have your strategies and techniques that you're using in the work you're doing now, mm -hmm. have they changed or not changed over the last pa half century almost? Yeah, the environmental justice movement is really growing. It's still growing. It's really big. There is recognition. I mean, universities now have classes on environmental justice. Holy moly, how'd that happen, right? Um, and, and, you know, it's growing it's, and it's learning from itself. It hasn't found its thing yet, so it's sort of stuck out there. Uh, and, and I think it needs its thing. I don't, I don't know what that is, um, but um, I, I, I'm just really proud and, and excited to be part of that. And... Yeah, I think it's... Well, I first read about you in the 1990s yeah. in my environmental justice class in college. <laughs> so it, it, it has been slowly starting, so that is good. <laughs> well, it, well, the thing is that where, where the, I think where the environmental justice movement gets stuck is on its goals. Mm. Is it really about disproportionate or is it disproportionate in something else? Right. And so some groups get really focused on this disproportionate um, dumping on, on people who are poor or brown or black or whatever, and that's important. But is that really going to get you where you need to go? Right. So where's the something else? And so that's where the, some of them are getting stuck. And so we help try to help figure that out for them. Yeah. Okay, getting stuck there. But like, what, what else can we talk about? Yeah. And um, one of the things we did extraordinarily well was we did this um, series of conversations called, we call it, we, internally we called it Eco Devo, but it was economic development. So go, instead of going in and talking about how you're being poisoned by all these industries and how your children are sick and blah, 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 let's begin with 
what don't you have in this community? What do you need? And if not this nasty thing, what would you, what would you choose? The most dynamic conversations ever because nobody, and actually this one gentleman in, um, in Atlanta, Black Hawk County, uh, African American uh, older fella, stood up and said, well, Ms. Gibbs, I didn't know we were allowed to speak about that. Well, I didn't know we were allowed to, to think about that. And I said, well, if you need permission, sir, consider it done and, and do it. And, and this is a very poor rural community, but they came up with a great big plan. And in North Carolina, they ended up opening up a farmer's market and, you know, people who go to the beach pass this area and it was a big economic thing for them. And, and so, so they, that's where your pickles come from, Mount Olive. You know, Mount Olive pickles, do you know they did not have a farmer's market in Mount Olive? You couldn't buy a fresh piece of fruit or vegetable in Mount Olive. That was just like ridiculous. But surely we can come up with a plan for this. They, were, they, were, they beat back a landfill twice, and instead they, they start this whole big farmer's market stuff. But, I'm, but you know, really looking at, yes, we have to recognize and acknowledge that this is disproportionate and it's wrong and it shouldn't happen, and if it happens you can't clean it up, then you should move the people, right? But um, what else do you guys want? What else yeah. is there? And I think that's the way to think about it. Well, I think the other bigger frame there, too, is you know, in the last couple decades, globalization has really reshaped everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now there are lots of love canals in China. Yeah. And in yeah. Mexico. Yeah. And in Vietnam. And in the Philippines and all over the world. And so, you know, we sometimes really pat ourselves on the back of how much we've cleaned up the environment here in mm -hmm. this country. But a lot of what we've done is exported our pollution, right. exported our love canals mm -hmm. to countries that have authoritarian rule and no environmental laws. Right. That's right. And that's not a victory either. It's not a victory, but it's well disguised. And again, it's it well is. disguised by those in power. Yep. And that goes back to government. If we want a government, if we want a country that respects the environment, if we want a country that treats people equally, if we want a country that we're proud of, then we've got to change the way the government is. And I think one of the big questions is how do we get money out of politics? Because, right. yep. you know, <clears throat> they're in office because, you know, because somebody gave them a big chunk of change. So how has your relationship to the rest of nature changed since you were a little girl growing up <coughs> on Grand Island and, you know, run down to the, to the river? And, and what, what, how do you even understand what nature is anymore? And, and how has your relationship changed to, this, you know, the environment, the, the air, the water? Actually, <coughs> it hasn't. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> it hasn't because... I was never into nature. <coughs> I, I, sorry. <coughs> Feel free to take a minute. No, it's the cold water, honey. I can't do cold oh, water. Oh, no. Whoops. Cold water is bad. I, you know, everybody says, oh, you're an environmentalist. I actually was never an environmentalist. And Grand Island was like a beautiful environment, which I hate it, by the way. <coughs> so, so... My, my relationship hasn't changed with the environment. It's there. I want to protect it. I enjoy it when I go to the beach, or I enjoy it when we go mountain climbing in Colorado. Or, um, but my real passion is for people. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how do we right the wrongs of the people who are being harmed by what we're doing to the environment? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> if you could go back and talk to yourself when you were a little girl <laughs> back in Grand Island... What, what would you say about, you know, what, what was coming and, and what you should be ready for? I think I'd say, I think I'd say I, was, I should listen to my mother a little closer and how she dealt with all six of us children fighting over different things. So I knew how to deal with the adults that are fighting over different things. Um, I, you know, and I often say most of what I did, I learned from my mother, like, my mother said, you take out the garbage, you do the dishes, you set the table. How do you do, you know, tasks in the, an organization and stuff like that? Um, but I, <clears throat> I don't know. I think, I think the thing I would say is, like, you have no clue what's going to happen to you, girl. <laughs> Listen to your mom. Watch how she works. That's your best advice. <laughs> awesome. 
Well, I asked you to bring a quotation to I read did. to uh, to kind of end the show. Um, so I was wondering if you could could read that. And, and I almost forgot it and oh, left it in the car. Good job. <laughs> I did. I have a copy in case you need yeah. it. No, I do. But um, yeah, tell us the the quotation, but also what's what's the significance to you, and, and how do you does want it... the significance first? Or no, second? no. Let's start with okay. the quote. So this is this is John Lewis, Representative John Lewis, and his quote is: "A democracy cannot thrive where power remains unchecked and justice is reserved for a select few." Ignoring these cries and failing to respond is simply not an option, for peace cannot exist where justice is not served. Get in trouble, necessary trouble, and help redeem the soul of America. And it's, you know, it is, John Lewis has dedicated his life to the civil rights movement, and, you know, it, it's really... In 1963, when he was with Martin Luther King and building the march on Washington, you know, it, it's still true today that, you know, we have to get in trouble, in good trouble. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and we really, you know, if we don't do something, the powerful will always be powerful, and we will always be crying foul and, and crying hurt. And, and we really need to do it. And he, he just exemplifies that whole thing of power and change. And talk about risks. I mean, he was, in, he was on Bloody Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, he walked across the bridge in Selma. Mm -hmm. you, know, he, you know, he's just an incre incredibly courageous man. And guess what? He took all those risks. He did get arrested. He got clobbered over the head a few times. Uh, God knows what else happened to him. But he became the representative of the United States of America. So there if you're four, you don't have to be all that afraid. You know, that you still can be a, a huge, powerful person in America, have a good job and a family life, you know, standing up and taking risks. And I think that's, that's a message and, and what I really liked about Representative John. Well, you've certainly Lewis. gotten yourself in good trouble over yes. the years. <laughs> and thank you for doing that. And thank you so much for joining us. It's been amazing. Well, thank you for having me. So we have a little bit of time left. Woo! <laughs> Thank you. We have a little bit of time left for questions from the audience. We have two microphones set up at the front of each aisle. So if y'all want to, if anybody wants to ask questions, just uh, come on down to the mic here. Hope, would you take that and mic we'll, there? We'll scoot it a little bit. Perfect. Absolutely, absolutely. And we'll take. Uh, we we have just about ten minutes of airtime left. Um, so if you if we could get you know two or three questions aside, that would be terrific. If you want to come on down, uh, that would be that would be ideal. While someone's thinking about it, um, oh, you caught me just in time. <laughs> A book I'd read actually said that the EPA agents said they were the best oatmeal cookies they'd ever had. <laughs> that may be true. Uh, when Dr. Lucas was in Ohio and he was doing something equally nasty for EPA that he was doing for us, I sent a leader over to the meeting with a bakery box and on it it said, I hope you enjoy these cookies, you're happy, or your hostage holder Lois. <laughs> he put the box down, picked up his briefcase, put on his suit coat, walked out, took the rental car, the EPA rental car, went to the airport, and left everybody else there. <laughs> wow. <That's funny. laughs> Thanks for coming and telling some great stories. Really appreciate it. I, uh, um, I, re I remember reading Michael Brown's Laying Waste, which uh, chronicled a lot of the stories and some of the nationwide uh, coverage that you've uh, done. I was wondering what you think of the evolution from the Superfund program to like the voluntary cleanup and the Brownfield type programs. Do you think that's an effective uh, progression of that or do you think that's a setback? I think it depends on who's doing it. Okay. In certain states, the Brownfield program, they are really careful about, because it's, it's about reuse for the, for the most parts um, and they clean it up well and they reuse it well. 
uh, sadly, the vast majority of the places, they're just cleaning it up and putting low-income housing and stuff on top of it. So it's not so good. Or baseball fields where small children are going to be on top of it. So I think the concept is good. I think the carrying out of it is not consistent. And it really depends on, it, the truth is, it really depends on the state and how aggressive the environmental and, and public um, advocacy groups are in that state. And New York State has some really good folks here right. that really l work very hard. But, you know, Mississippi brownfields mean yeah. you, you use a rake and you take all of the visible stuff off <laughs> and then you build housing for low-income families. Yep. Yeah, I've, I've worked a lot in Texas and Louisiana mm -hmm. and the way the groups there talk about the state environmentally. I mean, it's just, they're there to work for the industry. Yeah. That's, that's their, yeah. their goal. I have a question. Um, so you mentioned the split earlier, and I was thinking about how that applies to conversations I have, for example, with conservative family members and why the environment has become, really since like the McCain um, and Obama election, uh, a, a partisan issue. And I wonder if that's become a roadblock for you for over the years, because it's my understanding that it wasn't as much of a partisan issue before. Mm -hmm. And how do you bridge those conversations with people who, you know, might view this as a liberal issue or, you know, not a conservative issue? How do you address those roadblocks with people? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I do believe it's a partisan, it's now being framed as a partisan issue. Um, and that, you know, all the liberals and the progressives and the Democrats, they all want to clean up the environment and the Republicans don't. The truth of the matter is it's not true. It really is not true. And like I said before, you know, President Trump cleaned up more Superfund sites in his four years than has been cleaned up by the agency over the last 10 years. So it's, it's not true. And, and my, my comeback is it's not true. It just, it just is not true. And we, and we shouldn't encourage that because by repeating it, what we're doing is every time you repeat it, then somebody believes it to be true, even though they won't say it to your face. Um, and, and I think one of the th keys for us to do as leaders is to make sure that when people come up on stage, they identify themselves as a, as a conservative, not necessarily Republican or Democrat, but as a conservative. Or, you know, we had this PTA mom. She was, she was a Christian coalition member from Waco, Texas. And they're like, well, people in Waco don't care. about Well, I most certainly do. And she had organized her school and stuff. So we really need to find those people those folks out there that are doing the work to stand up and do testimony to show that it's really not true in the field. It's, it's only the narrative that the politicians put out there because they you know, want to shift things. Well, and I think one of the, the things there <coughs> that Isabella, by the way, works Isabel? on the podcast and is one of the amazing hey. graduates from UB. Hey. Um, but um, one, of, one of the things... Um, that I think Isabella is getting at is this idea of language. Like mm -hmm. Newt Gingrich in the 90s was talking about climate change and how mm -hmm. it was something we had to aggressively address. And then at some point, the Republicans basically said, you can't mention yeah. climate change anymore. And it became a politicized word. Um, so do you, what do you do around language and around communication to communicate with different groups of people to get them on board with mm -hmm. what you're doing, but maybe using different types of language? Yeah, I mean, I think when we're looking at the national language that, that politicians, people are using, I think that's a problem. And we can't, I don't know how we change that. But if you look at community language, you can, right? So, so Ronald Reagan was talking about the bird's nest on the White House or some silly thing like that when he took over. But then all this stuff happened, right? And, you know, he's a Republican and, and he did a lot of different environmental things. And, and so we have to point out where it did happen and then use the narrative and the language that our folks, they, there's, not a, there's not a language for the public. There are languages for different audiences. And, and the question is, who, we, don't want, we can't move everybody, we just can't. Um, but who do we want to move? And what is the language that would move that set of people? Is it moms? Like, if we want to move moms and we say, well, say what you want, Republican, Democrat, liberal, or conservative, doesn't matter. Here's the thing. 
I want my great-grandchildren to be able to drink clean water and breathe clean air. And you can call it what you want. You can call it super fun. You can call it whatever. You can call it climate change. But this is what I want. So find language that says the same thing, but but looks at a you know a particular audience. I think that's what you really. We as a country need to move audiences, and we can't and we can't keep buying into this narrative that's up here with the words they use and we repeat. It's one of the things we we teach our community leaders because. First thing they always do is repeat what the other side said. Well, Occidental Petroleum said there was no problem at Love Canal, so why, why are we so upset? How dare they say that? There is a problem at Love Canal. No, you let it wrong, right? Why did you start with that sentence? Why didn't you start the, with a different sentence that says there's a problem at Love Canal and Oxy needs to be educated, you know, instead of repeating these things? So I think we really have to think strategically as a community, like who are the audiences we can move in, Thinking about climate, for example, or sustainability, who buys the products? When you're talking about sustainability, who buys a product? That's the audience we want to move. And then how do we move that audience? And we're not going to do whatever they do in DC because they're all just a bunch of goofs up there anyhow. But how do we really move that audience? And what is the language you need? And I think that's the way we have to think about this. There is not a cookie cutter language and narrative for everybody. One of the first shows I did for the podcast was with the evangelical um, climate activist mm -hmm. and he talked about how he doesn't use the words nature mm -hmm. and environmentalism or environment mm -hmm. um, he talks about creation and creation care mm -hmm. and when he reframes it like that and talks about how the bible calls for us to mm -hmm. you know protect and right. and lots of other things that are in the Bible around our relationship with nature, mm -hmm. then it gets through. Yeah. But it's stripping away that language that has become politicized yes. and that, that signifies other things. Well, if you look at the, you look at the el el evolution of climate change and the language, it started with global warming. And people right. are like, well, I'm in Buffalo. It ain't warm here. <laughs> you know, we've been waiting for it to get warm someday. So you know, if you look at the evolution of the words, because it mm -hmm. wasn't working. Right. Right? And right. so this is where they are. So just look. And you don't have to go back that far and how that's all changed. Yeah. Other questions? Oh. Hi. First of all, thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm sure when you were younger, you had a lot of self-doubts when this first started. And I'd like to know uh, how you worked through them. And then also, second part of the question, are you an optimist? about the future, or are you a pessimist? <laughs> okay, so self-doubts, you know, um, I still have them. Uh, you know, they say, well, when you go on stage, you, when you speak, then do you get a nervous stomach anymore? Yes, I do. Um, because I'm trying to change things, and I'm trying to convince people that they, they're powerful <laughs> and they're right, and it's really hard to do. And, um, you know, I think self-doubts are healthy, because it makes you rethink. Before you take your first step, you're just like, no, is this really the step I want to take? Is this the time to take this step? Is this the, is this the place to take that step? And so I, I always used it as a way to assure myself that I was doing the right thing. So, so I, would, I, I rarely moved quickly. It was always very thoughtful and, and, and that kind of internal struggle. It may only take you know a few hours, but it, it's still... Is this really what I want to do? And I am totally optimistic. I think I think the whole environment right now sucks big time. We're hurting, but I believe in the people. I believe that at some point, and I don't know what the tipping point is, but I think at some point, just like we saw in the '70s, you will have a hundred thousand people in Washington D.C. saying, "Look, we're changing this. Enough is enough," and and you know that's going to happen. I don't know if it, when it's going to happen. Uh, I'm I'm going to be there. I'm not going to organize it, but I'll be there. Um, you know, that I, I believe in the people, and I think right now people are struggling themselves, and they're going to have to figure that one out. I'm very optimistic. You're going to provide oatmeal cookies? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll bring the bullhorns. Our final question this evening from Ms. Tiffany Green. Oh, thanks. 
So I kind of, I have a multi-part question. I actually work in Niagara Falls right now, so I see a lot of what is still going on in the falls. We see a lot of those disadvantaged communities still facing some of the issues, whether it's post-Love Canal or even issues that have arisen since. So the first part is, what are your opinions on that? And the second part is, having been in Niagara Falls and knowing that area, who do you think should really be involved in terms of community members and stakeholders, and what do we need to do to kind of continue what's already been done? Thank you. That was a great question. Um, you know, Niagara Falls is, <laughs> it is what it is. It is, it is exactly the same as it was. And, and what Niagara Falls needs is leadership with kahunas? <laughs> kahunas, I think. Is that the right thing? I don't know. They, we need leadership that has some, some backbone because the problem with Niagara Falls is 54 industries there and they're all chemical industries. And the city is dependent on these chemical industries. And it's like the city is being held hostage by these chemical industries. And they encourage, I remember when Harry was in Goodyear, that they would send these newsletters home which were just ridiculous. You know, somebody was complaining about a chemical today. Ha, ha, ha. That wasn't even, that was like no different than salt or a drop of vermouth in the swimming pool of something else. I don't know, whatever they did. But they're belittling it and brainwashing the workers. And, and I don't think anything can happen in Niagara Falls until there's somebody who is elected in and, and city council as well as mayor who, who are working together to say, this is it. When Niagara Falls has a great opportunity to be a tourist city. And it tried to do this parallel path, tourism and industrial economic building, and it, it, it can't work together. And so I, I have hope for Niagara Falls, but I think that there's never been, at least in my experience so far, never been anyone in power who would stand up to those chemical industries. And I'm, I'm personally, I'm not sure that that person would survive anyhow. These industries are brutal. They're bullies. Um, and so it's going to take the people to really make that happen. Thanks. To wrap up, um, we'd like to, one more time, uh, we want to thank um, Mr. Stephen Lester, who's been here with Buddy the Dog, <laughs> the, and Ralph Cretelli, and Hope Dunbar, John Feige, and ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Lois Gibbs. My privilege. Next month, sorry, Josh, I shut it off. Next month, please do keep us in mind. Mark your calendar for May 12th. May 12th, we will uh, be talking with Dr. Richard Premack from uh, Boston College. He is a world-renowned um, uh, biogeographer uh, and a best-selling author. That'll be the evening of May 12th uh, on, at 6 p.m.